Okay, so we're going to start the community development committee meeting. Um, let's show the roll call showing that. <laughs> had a block there for a moment. <laughs> Councillor Mitchell, <laughs> Councillor Robertson, and Councillor Perry, and myself are present. Um, at first, we're going to jump into um, our number two resolution. Rec if we're doing that first. If we could. So oh, Josh has got a commitment. Okay. Because this wasn't his day. Kind of get you horn in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was told to be here. So, do you want me to set it up, Tom? Or do you yes, want? please. Um, so, we had a discussion um, Monday night uh, when we went to purchase the two police vehicles about buying um, a regular gas engine one and buying a hybrid one. Questions were asked at that point about why we were only doing one. And the two answers that came back were uh, number one, budget, because Josh was able to do that without going over the $105,000 that we had budgeted for the purchase. And the second was a concern that Josh had about bringing two new things in at the same time, especially given our, our history of how we've been um, turning the cars over. Um, there was a request from Councillor Robertson um, to, could we potentially re-examine that? So I think that's why we're here. Um, and if you look at the rules, the rules say if you voted in favor of something, you you can kind of open up the topic again. If you vote against it, you, you, you can't. Um, so while this is not a formal council meeting with formal reconsideration, um, that's kind of the, the general idea. When we, um, so I went back and looked, the initial idea was to um, take, essentially take money that would be in um, the police department fuel line and move it to the capital budget. The issue with doing that, it's about $3,500 that we're talking about. And um, we have the whole expense of the car in this fiscal year, but probably not all of the savings in fuel, even if it was gonna be 3,500. And I'm not sure exactly how we calculate that. So I, I don't know. Um, there, was a, there was a calculator that I sent in. So it, it was a, um, just a generic yeah. calculator from an article. So it's, I think it's, it can be difficult to figure out the exact numbers. And I don't want to be in a position where Josh has submitted a budget. His job is to live within that budget and to take $3,500 out of the fuel line just um, does not seem like a, a, a good thing to do. So I went back and looked and in FY21, of $7,400 um, of unspent appropriation in the capital equipment line for the police cruiser that we purchased this past year. So if council wanted to move forward with purchasing two hybrids, um, there we could move money, we could carry forward that $3,500 so it won't impact Josh's budget for this year. This it won't impact our um, commitment Issue at nope. all, so nope. that, which is good. Um, the other piece that I would just want council to kind of acknowledge is that um, Josh kind of is pushing into this world of hybrid, and his <laughs> idea had been to do it a little step at a time to make sure that one would work for the fleet. Um, if that one wouldn't work for the fleet, it would be um, a lot easier to deal with than having two, and so I just if he comes back and says, we're killing the, you know, it's it's not working. It doesn't have the, I don't know, the power, the. Or there may just be hiccups with the technology that and to put the vehicle down. Or, I don't and, expect any of that. But mm -hmm. if there is, I just want to make sure that we've gone on the record of saying, if we, it's going to be really hard for us to mask that if there are two. Josh, there must be other agencies around maybe not in close to us but that have started using these hybrid vehicles yeah anecdotally i happen to be in falmouth in march February or march and i feel like their whole fleet is now hybrid and that they are 
pedagogy. Mm -hmm. And I did some research too when I went home um, to look at um, how um, uh, uh, police officers are, are, or municipalities are changing over, switching over from gasoline to fiber to electric. Um, and, um, and they've been doing it. One of the articles that I read, they've had hybrid cars for 10 years. So, and, and worked out and worked out the kinks, but the ones that they're building now, the, the, the cruisers that they're building now are way different than they were 10 years ago. So I have every confidence. <laughs> Josh already told me he's going to give me a ticket and a fine, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I have every confidence that, that this would be this would be a good idea. And I also feel like I like it. I think when I what I said was I didn't realize how much the price had come down. And if it's only the difference of three thousand dollars that we could save in fuel potentially, maybe even maybe I don't know what you I don't know the mileage or the idle time or the things like that with this particular fleet. But um, if that if that ends up being a savings in fuel, you know, without any kind of strange hiccup in the in the hybrid itself. Um, then we would be making up that difference um, in the long run. It might just take a little while because we won't see the cars. Mm -hmm. We'd be. I'd, I'd love to see them in September. I don't think it'll be right. It'll be January, or February. So we won't okay. experience the same. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Take yeah. a little bit of a okay. lag time to, to catch up. Okay. And, and I would say even, even if we don't have the same amount of savings, it seems like the right thing to do. And see, I'm gonna be on a different camp on this. Yeah. Um, simply because I I I, I know that they're, uh, we're all into the environment, but I I don't want us to always be in this thing about all in, jump in, and every little approach we take, it's all in and every opportunity. And we do this with a lot of other things within the community. I think from an operational side of things, every you can look at a Bangor, Falmouth, um, Virginia somewhere. Their circumstances are definitely going to be different than circumstances within our own community. So to to once again blank, we, we try to avoid blanketing things. It's like if it works here and here, then it's got to work in our world too. I just worry that if something does happen, then the chief stuck with two of these vehicles. I don't think that we need to be in such a hurry that it's got to be all or nothing right now. I think it would be best we'd be best served for the chief to have the opportunity to be able to say, okay, here's what I've got, here's the result. Um, but I'm open to, to hearing if anybody else would agree with that or, or, or not. Can I ask a question? Uh, one, this isn't on the agenda, correct? Correct. No, we're two. We okay, so two, what's the purpose of this conversation? Are we trying to come up with a recommendation that's going to go to council on this? So the purpose of this is I need some direction um, because right now we are holding our pre-order, um, which is right now a hybrid and a gas engine. Um, and I don't want to hold it for too long because July comes and there are lots of people putting in orders for police cruisers ahead of us. Um, I need so Sophie, we're trying to make a decision on this for you tonight. This is not a recommendation to go back to council. So the this group cannot make a formal binding decision tonight, but I have often worked with council where I get feedback that yes, the carry forward is a good idea. Yes, you should move forward. And when it comes up to council, we're going to support this so that you can, I can work before the official council vote. Um, but yes, that's what I'm, I'm looking for some guidance here. Because we're not, we will come back together in early August for comp plan with a yeah. special thing. Okay, thank you. So Laura, do you have thoughts? Um, so the other, so Falmouth we know has switched over to this fully. And for how long have they been driving these vehicles? I don't know. I, I can't but like that. more than three to five years? No. no, I think this this latest version is the police interceptor 
SUV. Mm -hmm. And that's only been out for a couple of years. Certainly no more than three. I think it's only been two. But it's it's a second version of this hybrid style? Hybrid has been out really in police vehicles since 2010, 2011. New York City went to, I can't remember what version it was, but they've had hybrid vehicles for that long. I'm, I'm comfortable with this, um, but I, I don't feel strongly enough about it that I'm going to argue for it, but I'm comfortable <laughs> with it. Well, and the other thing too, the other part to this too is next on the, on the agenda is the climate change uh, 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 mandate that's happening in the state of Maine and that we will end up going hybrid, going electric, uh, because we are in a situation where we're trying to reduce greenhouse gases and the hybrids have a way better um, uh, carbon, I can't even think of what the term is, smaller a smaller carbon footprint will work here um, than a gasoline powered. And so, and so as we start making decisions about buying um, vehicles, we also start. We also have to take into consideration what's happening globally, um, and that we're in a climate emergency, basically, and that that has to play. That has to play into uh, decision making. I just want to make sure that if we go this route, that should chief ends up in a situation that's not a good situation, the council is ready to step up to make sure that that's handled and he's not left without something. I, I, a good point, Terry. I don't think we'd ever leave yeah. Chief Ewing in that kind of a situation. And um, I think there is a minimal risk, is, and, but there's a risk with any vehicle that you buy. Mm -hmm. You can buy a brand new gasoline vehicle and have a lemon. Um, Terry, I appreciate where you're coming from. In this case, I don't really have a whole lot of angst. I haven't heard people screaming, don't buy the hybrids, which in our world would have happened by now because it costs hate change. But they could have found a reason not to not do this. I've heard about it by now. I mean, I have officers that are already like, feeling all sorts of angst, but I'm not hearing through you know, regular channels that they, they just stay away from these yeah, things. I think so. the technology has been improved I'm, vastly I'm greatly. Yeah. I'm comfortable with it and would support it because we bring it to council. So we have to bring it to council just as a whole. So, I, 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 I would just, I would love if it's brought to council to be changed to this, that there is that little yeah. statement in there to say that should something go awry, that um, we are going to take care of it and there will be no discussion of what it'll look like. So what I'll do is in the background, which actually becomes part of the record, I will make sure that that is highlighted in the background material. Um, so the... The way this comes to council <laughs> is bringing back the order that you already approved and making a revising, doing some revising language to that. Um, and um, then also having a carry forward order yep. as well. So based on what I see, what I'm hearing is that if I go ahead and do this, I'm not going to get in trouble. And in, at the next right at the next council meeting, when we have orders to we'll make go it before, formal, we'll make it formal. Yes. Does that work? And that gives you the, the opportunity to put the order in. Yeah. That's Thank awesome. You. Thank you. Good. Good. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go to the first item, resolution recognizing a climate emergency and committing to a municipal climate action planning process. Um, first, Cheryl, thank you for switching it to today because of last meeting. Um, so <laughs> <Not a problem. laughs> take it away. Take it away. Um, well, I, I guess everybody's read this like probably like three or four times now. Um, so this was initially our first step in um, getting our regional our regional climate uh, plan together, um, but it turned into the second step, which is fine. Um, so this is our resolution. Uh, the Environment Committee um, worked on this um, uh, at one meeting. Just we, did, we took like three hours to put this together, um, and it's also the it's a it's a version, not a version, but a, a kind of a version of Bangor's 
resolution, but we um, we personalized it so that it came back to um, to Orno. Uh, we added the Penobscot River watershed, um, and um, uh, yeah, and that's just the. Uh, I guess I don't really need to read it out loud, um, but that's kind of where we're at. I would just add that. Looks like Sophie. Looks like you edited it to a little. Just a little bit. That's okay. Um, the the thing I would add to this is that it aligns with the state um, direction on climate action plan. Maine won't wait. Yeah. Maine won't wait. And um, one of the things that in the past has been very important to town council is if the council is going to make resolutions that we tie it back to our community and why it's important here. And I really appreciate the work that the environment committee did to to find those connections. Sophie, I have a question. I guess it's for you. I'm in the be it further resolved, the Orono Town Council directs the town manager to establish a public process to create a municipal climate action plan consistent with this resolve. Got some thoughts on how that's going to happen? So I think the first step with that happening um, is multiple steps, but we have at the staff level have engaged with the city of Bangor to do some climate action planning with a consultant that actually knows what they're doing, which is a wonderful thing. Um, and um, Cheryl and Dan Dixon representing the university are, are joining staff with that group. What that's gonna do is kind of give us a framework. At the same time, starting in July, the environment committee is changing its footprint with the town and is engaging in a much more public um, meeting process. There will be public meetings with um, on Zoom for the community to be able to, to see. So my plan is to have um, Cheryl and her team um, working a section at a time because the way we have it set up is the environment committee will be pulling the Orono information together and the Orono goals that we will then take to Bangor for to see how they fit with the regional goals. Okay, thank you. Laura, do you have any any uh, questions or thoughts? I don't. Thank you to the Environment Committee for working on this and applying their expertise. So is everybody good with forwarding this on to yes. council? So we will forward that on to council. Yeah. I, I will wait till September for this so it's at a regular council meeting that will be a little bit more publicized. All right, um, moving on to the next item, uh, discussion of Caribou Bog Trail Center project, uh, guest Bob Bass, Orono Economic Development Corporation uh, will be speaking with us. And um, he's going to be talking to uh, Bell about what- Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Bell, are you alive? I sure am. Are you ready for me to share number one? Sure. Yeah. You, yes, please. You all have these. I have happened to, I'm old fashioned. I have hard copies. <laughs> and if you want to know why we're talking, this is a, some of the plans of the, of the bill. So, Bell? Hang on. So, my understanding, I'm here to there you go. Educate, educate if you can go as a little bit, I don't know if you can go smaller, Bell. Kind of get a big picture. That's good. That's good. Um, just to educate and update, I guess, the council or the, at least this committee on what the Orno Economic Development Corp has been doing out at Taylor Road. Um, we bought the property in 2018 from the Smiths. It was 43 <laughs> acres private it could have been sold and stayed private it's it's in the middle of all these conservation lands it's the red dot there essentially um the land trust had always been after the ponds on either side which encompass about 36 acres in the two ponds but could never get grant money sufficient to satisfy a seller that wanted to sell the whole parcel and ideally as a business so OEDC had the cash and the patient, I call the patient money to purchase a property and wait for the land trust to get their grant money and buy that 
by the land spot. So that is taken place. We now have about seven acres and a pre-existing building right in the middle of this conservation corridor. And uh, <clears throat> as you may know now, you can travel from Bangor City Forest all the way to Kirkland Road in Old Town through a trail system. And our building is essentially centrally located. Thank you, Bill. Number two. Um, this shows you a little better uh, exactly where the property is. I think you all recognize where we are here. So there's no, the closest private land would be here. Uh, and well, the Smiths, the Smiths, don't, don't, don't the, Smiths the, <laughs> the Smiths do own the cell tower in the middle of that. That's that um, funny shape, the orange lot. Um, they maintain that because they get the royalties from the <laughs> cell tower. But uh, everything else is town of Orno or Orno Land Trust, uh, University Land to the little bit to the north and IF and W. So, anyways, it's it was all right there, and it would have been a shame from my point of view and the economic OEDCs if this were to sell and go away. So now the concept is to renovate. Uh, I guess you could go to three bell to renovate uh, the existing building. Which wait till you see it if you haven't. She'll get it up in a second. Sorry, Bob. It um, has locked up my computer. Just, just a moment. Hey, that's fine. Um, but there's an existing building there that was used as their office, and the lower building was uh, was storage for their worm business. Um, had had refrigerated cooler. So we're going to renovate the. It's really a ranch built in the late eight, uh, 80, 1980s. Um, so the structural is fine and the ranch is a uh, trust construction so we're going to take the whole the whole first floor is just going to be open space. Uh, so it'll be with all this is more of the storage building but this whole area is the ranch wide open with with a there'll be a ADA you one single unisex ADA bathroom. Um, ADA door and a ramp, and we're adding a south-facing porch uh, deck. I mean, this whole building looks due south, so it gets great sun and looks over both ponds. I mean, it's it's. Um, Rob St. Louis came out last summer to help me look at. Yeah, isn't that Seriously. wonderful? Yeah, isn't that just? Don't you see it? The magic there. And there's heron. Oh, geez, how'd you get there, Bill? <laughs> There we go. And that's that's what we want to turn it into. So uh, where the arrow is, that's really very little is being done to that section now. We were mostly for money, but siding new roof where the old building, I can't use my corner, but the old building had a flat roof on the right. So we'll add it, add that. Um, but that will be used, the garage door will be used for uh, snowmobile maintenance and, and you can come in and out in the winter. And the front is like, I'll be careful, Sophie. The front is pre-existing. This is where their worm packers pack worms. And, uh, but it's got a door on either end uh, you, and, and, and a bench you can set up ski waxing tables or uh, bike tuning things. So that, that little section could almost be left open all the time. But the real activity happens up, up above. Uh, and part of the goal also is to move some, we'll, we'll keep the existing parking on the Putnam Road, obviously. But if anybody's been out there on a Saturday um, with, the, with the land, uh, not, not the dump, the landfill, we don't have a dump anymore. But, uh, you know, if somebody's going there with a the trailer, and then at the same time, you get a family and kids and getting out and trying to put their skis on. It's a little, it, it can be a little congested. So hopefully a lot of the parking will uh, be right here. So you can drive to this, go to the building, change. I mean, this is obviously winter oriented right now, but change, there'll be some cubbies, storage cubbies, and uh, go for a ski, come back, 
have a picnic, sit down, get warm, go back out, whatever. Um, so that's that's the concept. Uh, so OEDC, in order to do this, um, we successfully got a recreational trail program grant, which is, believe it or not, is through the Federal Highway mm. Administration. Hence, we have to use all U.S. products, no particularly steel. So if we use steel roofing, it's got to be U.S. steel. Um, but that was a very, there we go, Bill, thank you. I mean, if you can read the, the last line there, 21 applicants, seven winners. I'm getting a little choked up. But there was only three of those seven winners, only three people got 120,000. There's only, they only issued, and that's their norm. Three categories, motorized, non-motorized, or combined. And frankly, I don't know where we fell. We were either non-motorized or combined. Or multi, I forget what it was. You, you got one of the 120. We got one of the 120. So really, we're one of three out of 20. Oh, that's great. Um, and this this gentleman, Doug Beck, very, very nice. I mean, I chatted with him for over a year doing the grant, and I finally met him on Zoom. Uh, but anyways, exciting. So that was, we found that out I guess, yeah, in January, and then, then the real support started. So there's been some other... Um, other private type grants that we're chasing, and then obviously uh, private fundraising is taking place. Um, and that brings me to, I guess, bell number six, which isn't all that. I just gave you page one of a, we have inked a memorandum of understanding with the Penobscot Valley Steep. But the ironic thing is OEDC is a 501c4, so we're not, if you give me money, we can't say thank you when here's this tax deduction note. Hmm. Penobscot Valley Ski Club is a 501c3 and they can do that. So hmm. they, and this is legal in the fundraising world and everything, they are our fiscal sponsor for these fundraising activities. Um, so you can write a check to them um, for this project and, and receive tax deduction. Uh, capability. Um, they are obviously in the, interested in this project. They have, they do all the winter grooming out there with their equipment and volunteers. Ideally, they're going to use the, this building for their equipment storage. They have a whole fleet of lease skis that are usually parked in somebody's barn so they can be central here. We'll do the leasing out of here. Um, it'll give them kind of a home that they've never had. Uh, so that's their interest. Uh, that's why they kind of stepped up to the bat. So as far as a business model, um, you could just leave that up for a while, Bill. Um, in that it's town land, land trust land, whatever, there can be no fees on the trails, free access. Same with the building. Um, it will be when it's open, it'll be staffed by volunteers and uh, any anybody in the public can come in and do this and use it. We'll be a donation box and they'll be encouraged to join as a member. Um, right now, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but we've been talking with the land trust and the ski club. They may well set up a dual membership in their membership organization, join the ski club or join the ski club and be a member of the Caribou Bog Trail Center. And that little premium will come to help expenses. And the same with the land trust. Um, the other part of the business model is, you, know, you could go to the next one, Bell, although it's not gonna show them much. It is not inked yet. There's been some back and forth, but we're to get three nonprofits to agree on everything is harder than getting this $120,000 grant. <laughs> but we're working land trust, ski club, OEDC to get a interim three year agreement to operate this building. I mean, obviously, you, you build it, that's been my focus but <clears throat> you got to operate it. Uh, 
So out of those three entities, Bill set up a, uh, a committee to, to, uh, to get the staffing and set up some rules and bylaws. Uh, I kind of lost my train of thought, but that's, that's getting very close. We're at revision 5.5 .5 right now. I don't forget when I started this, but um, I think we're very close and that will allow us to get a structure to go. And again, it's, it's set up to be three years with the hope that this whole thing will evolve. We don't really know what the best structure is or whatever, but out of, after three years, it may evolve and maybe the ski club opts to, to purchase the building and, and, and have it as their own or the same, the same, same structure stays in place. And, you know, I mean, OEDC isn't necessarily want to be the long-term, um, real, you know, real estate owner, but, but we, we can, or, you know, whatever. So that, that's why it's three years and we'll hopefully figure out, uh, something to do or how, how to finalize it. Uh, yeah, there it is. Now, therefore, I get, I stole a lot of uh, Evan Rickert's templates here. I told him, by the way. Yeah. And, and he said, that's okay. He stole it from Maine Community Foundation. Yeah, he's, he's pretty good at that. Uh, steal's a bad word. Um, borrow, it, it, literally yeah. borrow. As far as benefits, I mean, OEDC saw this uh, in a very probably not minor way, but there could be some real economic benefit to the town. I mean, I feel something like this will draw people from out of town. There isn't something that you've got to go to Penobscot River Trails or Quarry Road or somewhere. And, you know, active skiers do do that um, or mountain bikers or whatever. Um, bird, there's a lot of bird watching out there, as you may know. So someone will come to town, spend a three hours a year and go downtown and have a something, something to eat and drink. Uh, you know, so that's a possibility. Uh, and, and further, I think it will be, we think it will be, um, it's another attraction for Orono to have this type of facility right here. And, oh, I think I'll just run out there and put my skis on for now and go, or snowshoe. Um, and again, it's, I focus on that because that's kind of my focus, but it is going to be a four season, um, maybe not mud season and bug season. But Do you allow machines, no, that, snowmobiles on it? That's land trust issue. Um, I, don't. I don't think so, but they used to be, a, I believe there's a trail, which somebody think that's, that's true, but, hmm. but it just hasn't been active. It goes from maybe the town to push on. but uh and i think they honor anything that's yep. that's been that way but no atvs um and so it's it's all kind of in process but that's you know i felt i've talked to sophie a few times and i mean i i'm naive i think that most people know what's going on but i guess they really did so i i appreciate this opportunity to formally present it and we're always open to questions and suggestions um i did hear good things about it this winter yeah there was and the crowds out there on the weekend somebody it might have been bucky owens well, that he counted 47 cars one yeah weekend. yeah i mean it gets it gets very and as you know our winter wasn't the best yeah winter. and we've enacted we the ski club enacted the second annual reenactment of the caribou bog mm -hmm. race because they don't, the, traditionally the old one went from Bangor City Forest to Old Town, a lot of logistics. This can be all self-contained out here on these trails. So that makes a lot, it makes it a lot easier. You are out there skating. Yeah, people skate, right. yeah. So I really think that's that's all. And, and I think at some point there may, you know, it could be that OEDC in that it's, could be viewed as a town asset that maybe there could be ways the town can help us in little ways in supporting, uh, in supporting the project. 
as we as we figure out what those are as you mature as we mature what you i'm hoping to do something <laughs> that's so, a good update Bob. thank you thank you so one of the questions that was on here is the the what made this percolate up for this meeting was that bob um came to me as a good project steward would and asked if there was any way that the town could waive the permit fees associated with their reconstruction efforts. There are elements of the fees we absolutely cannot waive because we owe that money to somebody else. Um, and I would argue the electrical permits would be that way for us because we, we are paying for the electrical inspection and um, the state portion I think the question that has come up is just this has been moving in the background. Um, there we have other nonprofits in the community that still are required to pay the permit fees. So this really is, I don't feel um, something I can make a decision on. And I would need input from the council as to whether or not um, we would waive, council would waive that. I mean, we, could, we, could we could, you know, move it on to a conversation. I feel reluctant because I'm, I, I feel that if we create a standard for an individual, it's going to be ex an expectation. Uh, that's just my, my feel. Um, also, when we start looking at these things, we, we went from a budget that from last year that increased a lot um, to people valuations going up and some people are now really freaking out if there's even a slight thought that somebody's going to think that uh, that money comes out of their their pocket in, in essence i guess um that 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 would happen and they didn't get a break so i just i'm just really reluctant about stuff like this for those reasons so I, i'm not sure what everybody else thinks about that but i'm more open i guess to it um I, I could, I guess I'd want to think about it more, but the Orono Economic Development Corporation has a relationship with the town and has had an historical relationship with the town. Um, well, OEDC is a creation of the town. Yeah. We created OEDC um, back when um, the town built Three Godfrey Drive as part of an economic development initiative. The town owned the building. Municipalities do not want to be in property management. That is a bad place for us to be. So we created OEDC. And for many, many years, um, your town manager and economic development person were actively participating in OEDC. We're having monthly meetings. We helped establish budgets. The town loaned OEDC a lot of money and OEDC paid it all back along with the premium for the bond that we just paid off for Three Godfrey Drive when they sold the building. Um, the relationship with the town is a little bit different now. Um, OEDC um, is not meeting the way they used to. So I haven't gone to meetings in quite a while. Um, and so it doesn't take away and suddenly make OEDC bad. I just know, Tom, that you were used to a situation where the town was heavily involved in and in part of decision-making process with OEDC. We are not. When we sold the, the building, our relationship, while still cordial and, and part, we are not as tied as we used to be. Well, there's, I mean, in my in fairness, there's been no reason to be. I mean, the only reason you were so, the town was so focused was where's my rent money to pay the bond. I mean, all we were over was a landlord. Right. Who's who's on the who's on the on the committee? Well, Shep Shepherd is the uh, president, I guess, and I am as well. And uh, Cheryl's a liaison. Liaison. Uh, Mark Earhart is our vice. president. Principal. Principal. Yeah. Principal. When, was the, when was the last update that we've had? Because a lot of this I'm just listening to. After, me. well, the virus, I think we only met, we met on Zoom once. Right. And I and I think that's been my question too. I think I put, I, so I've yeah. been emailing Bob and some of the people on the, on the uh, court, on the corporation, uh, because I'm confused myself. 
about what well, role, I, yeah, what role yeah. the council plays and what role that well, we play. I think, I mean, in yeah. my, the, the council are liaisons and that's your position. It's a, it is a private nonprofit. I mean, we were, that's how we were set up. But anyways, I hate to let it digress into what OEDC is doing now versus this project. But I think that's been, I mean, there hasn't been between COVID and many, many faces on that board or have been on that board for 10 to 12 years. And, uh, right. But in the four years that I've been here, um, I, I think I've only met, you've only met twice. Well, I think there was a period where perhaps we didn't have any liaison representation for quite a while. Right. Um, I think I don't know if you were on board before Lori or, or anyways. It, it, well, uh, we got together. We yeah. were on board together. Okay. Uh, I think Lori's an image of one. Yeah. So, right. So this this idea. I mean, I, I really yeah. appreciate the update, and and I, I I recognize it as a significant community amenity. I think and I don't think we need to make a decision on on. Uh, Building permits at, at this point, but I, I well, guess I, I am I am just open to. Right. With to the, talk I, I mean, my I, my question too is with the hundred twenty thousand dollar grant, why is why is there a request for a waiver of fees? Well, because okay. the project's going to cost about two hundred twenty five thousand. Right, and then the and then there was a fundraising. There was supposed to be a fundraising effort in the spring, but that well, it's like not, a, well, it's ongoing. Do you? There's a, it's posted on the Steep Club's website and on the OEDC website as far as where to send money. Oh, okay. I have not prepared a letter. I've written probably four other grants right. in hopes of money, LOB, uh, Alphon. Have you done, I don't know, Andy Shepard used to do main winter sports. I don't know what it's called now. So it's got a different name now. Uh, it's some kind OSI, of, Outdoor Winter Sports. So that, but Andy's now at uh, Saddleback. But he'd be a good guy to talk to because they when up at Nordic Heritage Center, they, they I can't remember the, the Libra, organization Libra. 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 That may be, I don't know. Well, I am gonna reach out. Libra yeah. and Maine Community Town Foundation. I just spoke with the lady from them. Yeah, they, they're very helpful by the way. Yeah, yeah. And so no Libra and I got an August timetable, I think, for both of those. But so there is a lot, and actually we've raised we or there's eighteen thousand dollars of cash in the coffer. I mean, that's not a lot for a good start, hundred, but uh, if we do need to get a couple alpha type size. Yeah. Laura, do you have any questions? Yeah, I do. What are we, uh, Bob, thank you. I'm super excited, and I think this is a tremendous asset for the community, and I look forward to me and my family using it quite, quite blatantly. So thank you. Um, but so what are we talking about what level what how much money are we talking about when you're asking for permit fees uh, i think the site plan is around 300 <laughs> two components but i i don't even I, sophie suggested i look into that and i don't have the numbers i mean there's a building permit i don't know if they're in the 50 dollar range or do you guys have a plan, like a whole plan drawn up that shows exactly the breakdown of numbers that you got to your 200 and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be kind of something good to look at to see what exactly that entails, too. Sure. No, I, I have that. To be act, to be honest, it was budgeted when I did the RTP grant to be around 180, 190,000. So to be honest, all I've done is inflated it by 25%. I guess I'm not able to to even comment on whether I think the money is a good idea without a sense of how much money we're talking about. I don't know if it's five hundred dollars, five thousand dollars. I really I, so um, I I think once we have more information, I'd be very open to weighing in. I will do that homework and find out what what's. Uh mandatory to pay the state versus what's uh, forgivable. If, if you find out how much the permits are, because I don't have the ability to take your project and from what you've given, I don't, I can't go get the permits. You know what's exactly, yeah. exactly what's going to happen. Yeah. So if you can get the quote on what the permits would be for mm -hmm. the entire process, because there are 
payments, also escrow payments, because it will go through planning board. Will it go through planning board? It's a change of use, so it will go through planning board. Um, oh, planning board, yeah. Yeah. So if you can get me kind of the steps, because you're gonna have to talk to somebody about the actual project, then I can figure out, I can give the council, this is what we have to pay, this is out of pocket. You know, I, I can do that math for you. I don't need you to do that math. I just need you to Did take you know what, what you, you know up here. Pay? I know, I know that. Okay. Um, but if you can take what you know up here and talk with staff to get estimates, that would be helpful. Okay. I bet you can. But not on company time. I'll do that. On my <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. Though. I'm very good about that. Well, we appreciate I you stopping by, Bob. For a minute, because Tom, you never know when he's going to walk in. Yeah, yeah. I, I check on you every once in a while. Make sure you. You. you got your nose in the grindstone. <laughs> Hope you're feeling better. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Do you guys want to? All right. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks, Bob. All right, let's move on to number four, continue discussion of marijuana ordinance revision. Yeah. I was going to control the presentation. Um, all right, so it's before we get into it, uh, last uh, committee meeting, we had talked about a few uh, post adoption changes to the marijuana ordinance um, that kind of came up for various reasons. Uh, one of the things we talked about was the um, situation on Park Street with marijuana stores in the C2 and the, the setback to the, the university. Um, could you go to the first slide, Bill? So just to recap, this is what we were looking at last time where, you know, this shows, um, you know, the two blue dots are representing the you know, child care facility and the Islamic center and those red, the lots with the red dots are showing um, that you wouldn't be able to operate a marijuana store on those lots due to those two uses. However, on kind of either side of um, the C2 district, uh, you would be able to operate uh, a marijuana store on the lots with green dots um, because of that exemption that we had put into the setbacks, um, where although there was a setback from the university property line, um, because of the way we worded the exemption, you would actually measure to the nearest building on the campus. And because there aren't really a lot of buildings in that area, it created this situation where um, it was sort of going against what the intent of the council was when they were creating the setback in the first place. Uh, so we talked about looking into um, creating some, instead of doing a setback from the university property line, the whole thing, doing more specialized setbacks specifically from the entranceways. And um, I had talked about the Range Lake Road entrance, but council also brought up the idea of the the bike trail leading on the campus towards the top of the image as well. Um, can you go to the next slide? Okay, so what this is showing is really any lot on Park Street there that's in that blue area um, would be the same as the, the red dots on the last one. It's showing that all those lots, you wouldn't be able to have a marijuana store because of either the childcare facility or the Islamic Center. The, the yellow bars are showing that lots in that stretch um, wouldn't be eligible to have a marijuana store if we created 500 foot setbacks from those two university entrances. So the Rangeley Road entrance uh, on the south side and the, the bike path on the, the northern side. Um, so if you created those standards, um, you'd be left with one lot uh, in the C2 uh, along Park Street that was eligible to have a marijuana store. And it would be that really small quarter acre lot at the very bottom. Hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, so, Belle, can you go to the next one? Fairly similar. So this is just showing if you did, you know, really anything larger than that 500 foot setback from the university entrances, um, so this is just showing 750 that you would take away that 
lot that was allowed as well. Um, because I'm not sure based on our discussions about the intent of where we'd be comfortable having a marijuana store near the university. I'm not sure that one lot was really the location that um, council and the university were hoping the store would go. Um, but so if you bump it up higher than 500 feet to something like 750, you can see that there wouldn't be any lots along Park Street that would be eligible to have a marijuana store um, because they would all be within uh, one of those setback requirements, uh, at least one of them. Some of the setbacks would start to overlap and they would kind of be uh, not allowed for multiple reasons. So uh, with that being said, I wanted to take a look at, you know, originally council had, you know, a couple of different intents. We, we started looking at, okay, these are the areas where we think it's okay to allow marijuana retail stores um, but then these uses are things that we want to um, create setbacks from to protect the, the nature of those uses. And these are the distances and how we're going to measure setting back from those. So seeing that this is sort of the, the landscape here that would be created by doing this, I just wanted to kind of bring up um, an alternative. Uh, so if you could bring up the next slide, so. So the way that those past slides and currently our ordinance stands is that the setbacks are measured from property line to property line. So, and they're measured in a straight line. So when you look at the childcare facility and then one of those lots on Park Street, you just pick the two closest points from the property lines and go in a straight line. Um, however, if you measured that setback differently, there is the potential for it to open up more lots um, where then marijuana stores on certain lots would become eligible um, because they would, it would create bigger setbacks and it would you know, make them not fall under that setback requirement. So again, currently they're measured property line to property line in a straight line. And the reason that we use that is because in the state marijuana law, the only required setback in the state law is uh, from schools. And they state that that's from the property line of the schools. Um, it doesn't really specify whether it has to be a straight line or how that works, but that's really the only thing written into the state law about it. So we just kind of carried that over to all the other uses, churches, childcare, the university, everything. Um, Alternatively, uh, you know, you could do it more closely to how the state liquor laws measure their setbacks, which is along the nearest travel roadway or path and from main entrance to main entrance. So, you know, you could, you know, if you look at it as, you know, the, the entrance way to the store or to the sensitive use is really what we're trying to separate. Um, you know, this, it could potentially create a very different landscape when you're looking at measuring because you get lots that are located behind each other and, you know, where the back of one property line might be close to the front of another property line. Um, if the road goes around, it creates an environment where it, it's very different measurements. Um, it is. I yeah. Okay. Can I ask a question? So okay. on the prior slide, you said that with UMaine, we were we were not going by the property line, we were going by the building. And now on this slide, you're saying that currently we're measuring property line to property line. So in, yeah, yeah. So in general, the way the ordinance is written right now, it's you measure property line to property line, but we created an exemption for things like shopping centers and lots with multiple buildings on them. So like commercial subdivisions or things like that, where instead of measuring to the property line, only in those cases you would measure to the building itself. And that was the problem with the university was we didn't really mean to apply that exemption to the university. It was more meant so for 
places like the University Mall um, or other areas in commercial districts where you might have multiple commercial buildings all on the same lot. But when we got a legal opinion, we realized that that exemption would apply to the university. So that's what created the whole problem in the first place. But so in general, we were measuring property line to property line, except for in these cases where there were multiple buildings on a single lot or multiple businesses on a single lot. And that's why the university fell under that exemption. Um, and that's why we realized we wouldn't be measuring to the university property line. So the, I just want to clarify that this slide is not actually how we're measuring because we actually have that exemption in place. Right. right? Yeah, okay. we talked about that a, a lot last time, I think. So yeah, I was just saying in general that in general right now, the idea is we're doing property line to property line. That was like when we talk about the childcare facility or the Islamic center. Um, and I think it was the intent originally to go from the property line of the university. Um, it's just that that exemption made that not the case. Um, but that the, the main entrance was kind of different way of measuring than what we were currently doing uh, in most cases. But yes, there would be certain situations right now where we wouldn't measure just property line to property line. Um, so yeah, the, when you look at this different way of measuring though, um, it would be difficult to provide uh, an exact number of lots with how many, you know, new lots might be eligible for a marijuana store, um, because the, the setback distance that you'd be calculating would depend greatly on where a store was placed on any given lot. There's some bigger lots on the Park Street corridor or in the C1. So it could be a situation where if a marijuana store was placed on the front of a parcel, it might not meet the setback requirement, but if it was placed further back, then it would because you'd be measuring, you know, out of the driveway to the street and then kind of wrapping around more instead of just going in a straight line. Um, so that can be kind of illustrated uh, on the next slide. So um, Bell, can you move on to the next one? So, I mean, this sort of shows um, what I was just talking about, where on the left, you're seeing, um, we're measuring from the property line of the child care facility to one of the uh, lots on Park Street. And with our current method, you know, it doesn't meet the setback requirement. It's only 800 feet, and it would need to be 1,000 feet for that, that small lot to be eligible for a marijuana store. However, if you use this alternative method um, where you're measuring along the, the roadway or a traveled path, that measurement becomes you know, over 1,300 feet and that lot would, would become eligible for uh, a marijuana store. Um, although that particular lot may not be eligible if you create a setback requirement from the bike path, but this was and purely for illustrative purposes of how the measurements could differ. And, um, and Kyle, you're, you're presenting this alternative because this is the way we would measure for a liquor store and how close it was to a church or a school. Or right. And I mean, really, this it's not that I'm necessarily advocating for yeah. this or anything. Okay. It's um, the council had originally said it was okay with marijuana stores being in the C2. And based on those first couple of slides, uh, it seems like we were creating um, an environment where it was basically impossible for a marijuana store to operate um, on the C2. Um, just because when we had initially talked about it, we didn't look at every single lot. Um, so this is offering uh, an alternative way if the council still wanted to find a way to create opportunities for marijuana stores on the street. Um, this would really be, I think, the only way to, uh, to kind of go about that, so. Uh, and I had a question too. Yeah. So, so let's just say that um, 
I'm just going to use thrift thread because everybody knows thrift thread as an example. If that field in back of thrift way or the, that that land in back of thrift way ever opened up, that would be behind thrift way and that would be still in the C2, but far enough far enough away, right? For are you talking about like this slot? Here yeah, where there's really person? nothing. There's yeah. really nothing there, yes. and I, I th aren't there plans for a road back there at some point too? Wasn't well, there? Well, it was in our Park Street transportation study, right? Um, that was conceptual, but, I mean, I, but yeah, hopeful. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, so would that that would still be in the C two, right? So and need the setback requirements because it would be further back away from the university, right? So that lot there is one of the ones where right now. If you measure property line to property line, that undeveloped lot falls within 500 feet of the Islamic Center lot. Okay. If you're measuring property line to property line, straight line. But if you were to measure from the Islamic Center's entrance, the Islamic Center set back like 100 feet from Park Street. So if you go out to Park Street, then you know up Park Street, and then onto that lot, deep deeper into that undeveloped lot, mm -hmm. yeah, you probably would be over the 500 feet and it would be eligible. So it's situations like that where, depending on where something was proposed, um, yeah, it could be possible that something would be allowed there that isn't necessarily allowed now. Okay. Um, yeah. Then the next question, my follow-up question, because it is um, if we decide or if, there, if a decision is made that we are going to allow the C2 to be, to have uh, marijuana retail stores, um, but there is currently no, no place for it mm -hmm. right now, right? But in the future, if somebody were to build there, then they could build there if we have, if we have deemed that zone appropriate for, uh, for a facility, for a marijuana retail store. So what I'm saying is, is not to cut off our, you know, not to say, no, we're not going to do this here and then have to go back in a couple of years and go, well, this is far enough back from the setback and then have to rezone it. Right. If, yeah. I think that's something we'll get to with one of the, the last question, really. Right. And um, I think that's why I started thinking about what you were Yeah. Asking. So if you don't mind, we can wait till then. Sure. To talk no, about not a problem. Um, but yeah, I, I think I know where you're Okay. So can um, I make one comment about this? I, I'm, I don't agree with this different measuring method because it continues to pin us into strictly vehicle traffic and does not accommodate the fact that we are a community that values and prides ourselves on bike and pedestrian access and are unique in our region for the walking trail and walking access and relying on a car access measure to me does not align with that value of our community. I think and Kyle's just giving Kyle's just taking an opportunity to say this is a, what it what it could look like if it was an option. Um, it was, we're not saying that this is an option. He was just showing us the different methods of measuring that people use. And I, it could include other you know, formalized paths and, and things like that. It doesn't simply have to be, um, it can be any sort of travel way and we can define it however it's just we want the, it to define it's it. It's just the difference between as the crow flies versus how people get there. Right. So if, yeah, if there was a major, you know, walking path, I mean, it could be taken into account. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, Belle, could you bring up the next slide? So this really gets into the, the kind of specific feedback now that uh, we're looking for to kind of move forward with amending the ordinance. Um, so the first question is really the foundation for the next couple of questions is, um, you know, is the council interested in adjusting the way setbacks are mentioned or are measured uh, to potentially open up some lots along Park Street to be eligible to have marijuana stores. Um, you know, does that change in, in measurement? Um, while it's a change from the original way we wrote the ordinance, does that still meet the intent of the setbacks that were created? 
uh, originally. Um, and I would just add that while we're talking about the C2 here, if we change the way things were measured as far as these setbacks, that would apply to other districts as well. So, you know, when we talked about the C1 and how you could potentially have one marijuana store in the university mall or like where the Burger King was, but both of those wouldn't be able to. This might create a situation where you could have marijuana stores on both of those properties, um, depending where it's located on, on each of those lots. So, um, and there are a lot of kind of larger undeveloped parcels in the C1 area as well. Um, so, it's really hard to say how those might in the future be divided up or developed. Um, but, you know, this, a change like that could mean changes for that as well, where you could potentially be allowing more than what we initially thought was good. So, uh, I, 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 I'm on it. I'm confused by this question, like, because it's, it's saying, do we want to change it to make more lots available? And I, I didn't think that's why we're here. Like, I guess, so what? So my reason for bringing it up was because we had initially zoned marijuana stores for the C2 district um, under the assumption that it, it would be possible for a, a marijuana store to operate uh, in that district. So I just wanted to bring up the option um, if that was a, a goal of council to allow marijuana stores to operate there and actually have um, one or however many um, actually operating on Park Street, this would really be the way you would need to go, something like this, for that to happen. Um, if the council's intent was, yeah, we'd be okay having them operate there, but we also, you know, had the intent of creating these specific setbacks, measured specifically how they were written. Um, then that's fine too. I just wanted to to kind of present the option um, and way that the different goals the council had set when they created the ordinance language um, and kind of balance. So, so based on the discussion that we had last time, yep. where council now want was discussing wanting setbacks from the university entrance and the trail entrance mm -hmm. that in it if if that's where council's wedded to go then staff's recommendation would be to simply not allow marijuana stores in the c21 park street because allowing in a very small narrowly defined space um or putting it making it allowed and then creating setback issues that make it one little parcel over here is going to cause incredible headaches, as opposed to simply saying, when we looked at this again, we just decided we're not gonna allow it in the C2. That's one option. What Kyle is, I think, trying to say, is he's trying to split, thread the needle here to say, you said you want, you were okay with it in some areas in the C2, Two, if you still want to do that, we're going to have to look at an alternative method to calculate some of the setbacks that you have in other places. So, you know, he's not like trying to just make stuff up. Okay. He's trying to take the goals that he has heard from council. And I think what he needs, and while he's focused as a good planner would do on these very specific questions, I think the highest level question is, knowing what you know about the setback now and knowing after your discussion about the trail and the main entrance, are you wanting us to try to find a way to still allow mm -hmm. development in the C2? And if you do, then we're gonna well, have to- Can we discuss that first question? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait, so, let's let Sophie finish, please. I was just going to say, if if the answer is yes to that question, then Kyle is going to need to think about some creative ways to open up enough parcels so that it makes sense mm -hmm. to allow. 
because that one little parcel down by the edge, I would argue is not a place that we really wanted it, right? We didn't want it as on the gateway to the university. And the alternative method, the, 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 the way that you're showing the measurement is consistent with the, with state liquor laws or state liquor licensing? Right. Okay. Um, as far as I can tell, I was looking at it um, uh, a few times. I mean, those setback measurements are different. They're, their numbers, the, the feet required are less. Um, and yeah, it talks about the travel way, the ordinary course of travel, I think it, it says. Um, and I mean, we've talked about though, that marijuana law isn't the same as liquor laws. And right. you know, we at times we've compared them in certain ways, but you know, you know, maintain that they're different in other ways. Um, so, I mean, I was using that as a basis, not necessarily that we had to match the liquor side of things, but just as this would be an alternative way. So, so when you look at that as kind of the basis that got you looking at the map, mm -hmm. might it, instead of getting mired down in the, how do you want to calculate? Right. Would it make sense, Kyle, for if the group decided, yes, we want to move forward, couldn't we in the ordinance just call out the lots where it's allowed? Yeah, I think so we could get away from well, the, the set, the measurement part, right? And simply right. And pull up the map and say, we're good with the this cluster of maps of lots over here. Is that right? And on the, I think the, the second question, I, yeah, it sort of started to go that way of talking about um, with the university entrance setbacks, it might be good to start thinking in terms of like a, a line on Park Street that you want to draw instead of thinking in feet. Because if we're talking about coming in and out of lots and using those pieces to think of the measurements, it might be better to just to think of it, you know, beyond this point mm -hmm. on Park Street, you can't have one. And, you know, once yeah. you get to this point, you can't have one after that. Um, but yeah, I do think uh, it, it was the last question that I, I worded on here, but I do think that yeah, obviously the big fundamental question is, um, you know, whether council wants um, to just simply not allow them at all um, in the C2 corridor, um, because with our current way of, uh, of measuring setbacks and how it was originally written, and then with these entrance setbacks, um, that would definitely be the cleanest, easiest way when developers see that, oh, marijuana stores are allowed on Park Street, and then they call and ask lots of questions, and we have to tell them, well, actually, no, it's only written that way because maybe one day one of those sensitive uses might move, and then it would be allowable, but right now it's not. That would, I think, create a lot of conversations that really didn't ultimately go anywhere. Um, so yeah, if you were going to keep the original setbacks and these new kind of entrance setbacks, then yeah, it probably would be the best option to just say it's not allowed in the C2. Uh, but if it was the goal uh, to have the opportunity for some, then yes, we could look at different ways uh, to create an opportunity for that. Um, I have to leave, but my, my um, vote or not vote, but my thought is that I don't want to completely wipe out the C2. I would like to see it be open uh, to stores. I like Sophie's idea about restricting it to specific lots. And my concern is that if we just have this, if the C1 is the only area in, in, uh, in Orno, then we really will only have one, uh, we're kind of closing ourselves off to economic opportunity for other people. It is legal. Um, the town of Orno voted on it. I don't have any problem with it. Um, the restrictions, the, the 21, you have to be 21 to get into any of these places um, anyway. So there's a very strict ID uh, situation with these stores. And um, I'd personally like to see uh, the C2 be available. That's just my, my thoughts. Laura's waiting to speak also. 
Yeah, so I when I look at the community and the conversations that happened around early in with the council on this, there was a desire to not have these fully integrated into family neighborhoods. And when I think about the diversity, equity and inclusion in this community, a lot of it is socioeconomic. And there is a large population of lower socioeconomic families of which I grew up in right there in Talmar Wood. And I do not think that this is an appropriate zone to be placing a non-federally regulated retail outlet of marijuana. And I, I strongly am against this. And I, this is the crux of the issue, not setback numbers, not whether people walk or bike. This is an equity issue for these families. This is a campus that does federally regulated, cannot have this on their campus. I, th this is a bad public health. This is a bad environmental health. This is not a good long-term decision for us as a community to be mixing this in, in non-equitable ways with youth and families. So I am against C2 being a location for retail marijuana understanding that this is where C2 is. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I was not a fan of the marijuana <laughs> movement to begin with, um, and I would be comfortable with not allowing them in C2. I'm just curious, can you go into that that store, Thriftway, can anybody walk into that store? Do they sell other things? Because one of the things we want to talk about equity and stuff like that, they put signs up on the building for cigarettes, which is a typical thing for inclusive, uh, you know, for the equity within communities of, of lower income, if that's the case. If that's what you're saying, Laura, that it's a community with lower income. Um, that they, they tend to put cigarette places and, and, and signs in places like that all the time. Um, uh, so this stuff exists, obviously. Um, the community, I'm, I'm, I try to, I mean, I hear what you guys are saying, but I come from a community perspective of what these people that I, that I represent voted for. And, and if we said that the whole community said yes, but then we start to really limit it down to just one or two spots, then we're doing a disservice because we're taking it to heart. Not that to feel it, to say that your emotions on this, I could understand. I mean, I'm, I'm emotionally charged on certain things too, but ultimately I have to look at what the public asked for and what can I do to make sure that that is, it, that goes through. So. I, I appreciate that. I mean, I think that's a very valid perspective. The only response I have is the public voted on the ordinance that we presented to them. And the ordinance we presented to them had these distances. We hadn't measured them. We didn't know that it wasn't going to work on those lots on Park Street. But they approved the ordinance that we presented to them. And I'm happy with the ordinance that we presented to them. And if that means you can't have a marijuana store on Park Street, so be it. That's what they voted on. But you actually can. You can have three down at the one end and the yeah. one at this okay. end. So. But so I'm going <laughs> to understand that ultimately the decision is a council decision. And I, I don't think I don't think Kyle or I have any um, personal opinion as to what should happen but throughout the entire discussion on marijuana the only perspective i brought back from my discussions with the university is that they did not want the um any stores in their gateway areas mm -hmm. right they were very clear about that and um so the discussion that was had 
if people went back and actually dug into what was in the ordinance and the discussions, I think the thought was that if anything was going to be allowed in the C2, it was going to be allowed up way up in, and there wasn't a lot of opportunity in the C2. I'm going to take two steps back and say in my 20 years of being a town manager, my experience is very few people who vote on ordinances, read them. They read summaries and they assume that the town council or board of selectmen have created what is in the best interest of the community. So I just, I want, I'm just leave it there. So, so can we, can we contact the university? Because I think, it, it, and to clear this up, because I think in the last conversation we had, and this will be about the gateway stuff, if, if they consider that bike path a gateway, um, because if the university considers that bike path a gateway, then it's a, it's a, it's a move point. We, we can just say, shut that area down and then move on. Um, because that was part of the discussion last time was, is that really, because kids use that route. So uh, I can absolutely do that. I will tell you that any way to, to widen the, the distance from all of those students and marijuana is probably where the university is going to come down on. But I, I can, I can absolutely reach out um, to my contact. No, I mean, if it's, if it's, if it's, a, if it's, it's that's considered a, a gateway for all those kids that go to the university, then we really don't have, I mean, it would be get rid of the C2. So Bell is on it and they do. So that's, I guess that makes and, our decision then, doesn't it? And they have future plans to create a new entrance there. Mm, so, or along so with that. Laura, to, to the thoughts that we just had, then based on what the university's comment is, is that all those places down there would not be eligible. The one little rinky dink one down at the other end really isn't a, a space for it anyway. So yeah, it would have to be out of the C2. Right, I mean, to me, that does seem like the, because otherwise, yeah, you're coming up with something where you're saying, okay, it's not allowed in these areas around the entrances and maybe there's a section in the middle where right now nothing is allowed because of the child care or Islamic center, potentially one of those could change and you know, you wouldn't have a setback there. Um, so I mean, you can leave it allowed there and just have create setbacks and, you know, have it be on the ground. You can't actually, have one right now, um, I guess that becomes a question of weighing, you know, is it, is it worth having all of those conversations with developers and spending the staff time to deal with that, you know, in- Kyle, I think, I think Terry just said no, right? Is that what yeah, you were thinking, saying, Terry? I'm, I'm just thinking that the, if they're considering there's a gateway there and there's going to be a potential road, then it's, right. yeah, we, we just it's, can't, we won't be able to do anything. And I think if things change on the face of the ground, I mean, that's, yeah, we, we change right. ordinances so, all the time. Yeah. And so it's not like what we take here. I think the reason that staff came to you with the moratorium and let's come back here is because what we advertised during our conversations was not what the legal, that that change made. So um, I, I am wondering, Kyle, if it would make sense for you for the next meeting mm -hmm. to bring back a language that just eliminates yeah. the C2 is what I'm hearing. And could you also take your time at that next meeting to focus on the um, language changes on the other questions that you had um, from the around, last meeting. Yeah, so yeah. around nurseries so, and that kind of stuff. It would, I think it would be good if we could come with actual right. language and let people critique it as a, yeah, that to was, give them a. That was the plan. Once this question was resolved, next step, implement this feedback and last meeting's feedback into an updated I, amendment. I do wish there were more than three of us here. So by, um, by doing that, it gives you an opportunity to discuss it yeah. again because it, it will come back. But well, I, I, I guess what I'm saying, excuse me, for no. I, I guess what I'm saying is, um, 
Kyle just said, we've, we've resolved this issue and, and I'm not 100% sure that we have. I resolved it for me. So from my perspective, we've got a moratorium yep. in effect. I'm trying to continue to move this work forward because of the other work that I'm now piling on Kyle's yep. plate. I think if we get to the next one and a majority of council is here and they flip, yep. then we'll deal with it. But I think if we continue to leave it as an unresolved thing, it just makes it spin for. Right. I mean, it's not going to take much work to write in the ordinance that it's not allowed. That's really just removing a couple of things. <laughs> so, yeah. Good. Um, okay. That, does that work? Yeah. Um, and Kyle, I know you've done a lot of research here and you've tried to be really creative, and I appreciate that. Yes, you've done a nice indeed. job. I always appreciate the work you do, Kyle. Thank you. That's always a tough one. Yes. Mr. Yerksa. So we're going to move on to priorities for 2020 general obligation bond proceeds related to fiber optics project. Hey, Bell, can we see you for this one? You are. You can. And I'll even try to actually look at you using the right monitor. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we are here. Um, because when we went through the entire process back up last October to sell or to issue the general obligation bonds, we issued $2.25 million of new debt. Yep. And um, 2 million of that was specifically slated for infrastructure projects. And $250,000 of that was a, initial, um, originally um, planned to be a loan to OTO, OTO Fiber Corporation to allow them to um, build out their next phase of um, fiber for the community. They had come to us with some areas that were um, of particular interest, and they were going to pay that back over the next 20 years based on the revenue that they received from that build out. So OTO Fiber is um, a really with it corporation. Has, they have an awesome president too, but um, they managed to ink a deal with Otelco where Otelco is now gonna fund that build out with private dollars. And um, OTO Fiber is not gonna have any revenue to pay us back. So it, becomes important for us to come back to the council because the the direction that we were operating in has now changed. There is a restriction on that money. We can't just use that money for anything. We have to use it for infrastructure investments that could include fiber, but um, it's public works infrastructure investments, including the fiber network. So I have here, um, our public works director who could tell you how he can spend the money and Bell has some ideas as well. Always, I, I mean, I, and so I really like to kind of turn it over to the two of them to talk about potential. I am not asking for direction on specific projects today. I am looking for, do you want to still try to fund fiber? Do you want to fund infrastructure? Do you want to fund a combination of the two? So I'm going to pass that along. So Rob, would it be uh, okay if I went first since I need to share my screen to do so? Yeah, I was gonna suggest that. Okay. <clears throat> Look at how well we play together sometimes. So what I'm gonna share with you right now is um, what the build out is actually going to be for um, the Otelco um, project, uh, and then what the options might be um, if the council chose to use the $250,000 for um, a fiber build. So right now, um, and it's still kind of in high level design, but this is the intended coverage area for um, Orono for the Otelco uh, project. It also, this also includes the Old Town build. So right on uh, route two, we will get um, from um, boundary to boundary uh, in the town line. 
um, they yes. will, um, <clears throat> the Polygon doesn't actually show it, but they are actually not going to um, fund out a build uh, into the um, large student housing um, projects, but they will fund all the way down uh, Route 2. What that does is it leaves a few spots um, without um, fiber coverage and without a clear business case for Otelco to fund fiber coverage um, out to the um, areas uh, because of density. So now, can you clarify what we're looking at? So we're not looking at the lines, we're looking at the sh like the whitish shading. Yep, so the whitest shading is the um, essential coverage. The lines are, um, these are places that we highlighted for um, Otelco to, um, in fact, I will turn them off for you. Um, so the whitest shading and due to Google Earth weirdnesses, I don't know why the polygon shading, when you get a little bit close, starts getting sketchy, but it is a solid, you know, it is full coverage. So that Thank is you. the area that you will be able to access fiber from based on the Atelco build out, that right. shaded area. Yep. Um, so currently um, they have page place still in the build, even though it is underground. Um, utilities, but they do not have Winter Haven in the build because it is um, underground uh, utilities. Um, I know that the Winter Haven neighborhood has um, kind of gotten together and all submitted their interest uh, and, you know, Otelco may decide that there is a business case for doing underground, but at the moment they're saying no to uh, Winter Haven. Um, so, the $250,000 that the um, town has could fund this stretch of Stillwater that has no coverage. The only reason why we're able to get across 95 um, at this moment is because of the investment that the town made uh, previously to bring fiber to um, the public works garage. And by doing that, we are able to do what they call um, an overlash. So we essentially tie a new fiber to that um, existing fiber. And that gets us across I-95, which is a very difficult thing to do. Um, but Otelco has chosen not to fund this Stillwater stretch and it was not part of our um, growth area. And we only had, um, you know, six miles of leverage within um, the town. So this was left out of the agreement. Um, and then also Forest Avenue out past 95 would not have um, any fiber coverage. Uh, $250,000 could get you roughly this whole stretch um, and a backbone piece down all the way to Villavon, it could include, um, instead of Villavon, it could include neighborhoods, or it could include a subsidy to entice um, Otelco into um, building in the underground neighborhoods uh, like Winter Haven and um, Page Place. And um, currently the approach for Godfrey Drive is that they will come in from um, Bennick Road so far to about here and that they would come in from um, Stillwater to about here, um, which leaves this area um, uncovered. Um, is, so is we have a large section of, of Orono covered with the Otelco agreement, but there is definitely some area that would not be covered and you would not, um, there's really not a business case for it because of the density. So, Bill, we're talking about a 200 plus million dollar bond and your your project is like 250,000. Is that right? Or 250,000 dollar bond. 
So the, the bond is 2.25 for the new infrastructure. And the, the 250,000 was originally for OTO fiber to put drops in the pilot area so that the um, fiber could get from the um, pole to the home and then a small expansion um, in the downtown area. When we put out the RFP, we found out that Otelco was planning to come in uh, to this area anyway, and we were able to work a deal with them. They were going to fund all the drops and we were able to leverage our existing pilot um, network that was up to get them to go into places that they were not intending to go into in their first build. So what we're seeing now is bigger than what they had originally intended to do. Good. And we were going to, with the money that we would have earned by leasing out the dark fiber, we would have paid back the bond. Now there would be no money earned by leasing out dark fiber. This would be the town putting up money to own some dark fiber that uh, we would have somebody else operate in the same way that we're doing now. So Otelco or somebody else would get the revenue from the dark fiber that we would put up, I don't like that. So what you're doing is you're saying, because it, it's kind of like the spectrum argument that we hear often, right? When um, we have franchise agreements, they're required to build out to a certain density but that leaves people in right. the outlying areas without access because right. there's never going to be a business model where they can make money on the capital investment. So it's the idea is that we um, make the capital investment so that they can then run Sorry. light it up. <laughs> so that's Good that is that's one option, and the other option or combination option, however we wish to look at it. Yeah, so I um, just made a quick list of projects that are, um, I don't wanna say on the back burner, but they're projects that I know that need to come up that are, that are currently either in the process of searching for funding or they're just simply unfunded at this point. Um, probably the highest priority for me right now is the outer piece of Park Street. So. Uh, from Boulder Drive, roughly in that um, in the area of where uh, American Legion is, to Old Town. That's probably our roughest piece of pavement right now in town. Um, that would be just a basic, just a basic surface rehabilitation. So a mill and fill project would cost around two hundred thirty-five thousand um, dollars. We've also identified um, three relatively significant drainage issues. Uh, primarily associated with uh, dilapidated infrastructure on Hillside Road. Um, they are uh, three, so the Hillside Road has three little systems of, of drainage that um, all need upgrades. Um, and I roughly estimate that cost to be around 400,000 to make those repairs. Uh, and that's not improvements, that's just fixing what's there. Um, the other one that does appear on your capital plan is funded for next season, but we could opt to, to move that up is the Bennett Road preservation paving. So that is listed in the FY23 capital infrastructure improvements list. Um, but that is, uh, you know, if we're looking at keeping the pavement that we have in good shape, same argument that we made when we decided to fund Essex Street. Bennett Road, um, over the last 10 or 15 years, back in 2006, stayed in a major reconstruction project on the outer piece. Um, the town has made some pretty significant investments in that corridor over the last 10 years or so. And a preservation pavement at this point would help protect those investments and yield another 12 or 15 years of quality pavement through the that project cost originally. Well, there's been several iterations, there's a bunch of different pieces there. Um, the first piece back in the 2006 range was a two, two and a half million dollar main DOT project that the, the town provided would have paid 10% to support. The next thing that happened would have been the 
the large culvert replacement that we did out toward the town line, that was about a half million dollar investment. And then the most recent piece would be the in-town piece from noise drive into the town. Um, and that, as I recall, was in the four to $500,000 range. So, um, and I estimate the, that would be a, a basic shimmer overlay. So it would just be a surface treatment. Um, no sidewalks, curbs, or anything like that comes around two hundred and eighty-two thousand dollars. It appears in the FY twenty-three um, capital infrastructure plan at three hundred and fifty, because that does include some sidewalk improvements, drainage, curbs, and things like that that we would like, that we would like to do. But if we're just looking at a preservation paving, that's around two hundred and eighty thousand. Um, the other thing that came to mind um, is the idea of creating the fourth leg on the roundabout. Um, so there has been some discussion in association with development in those areas um, to create some sort of an alternate route to access some of those larger developments. Um, a fourth leg on the roundabout, which was uh, at least in concept, thought of when the, the original design was done, um, would could be created splitting the two businesses that are on the opposite side of the range of the road and looping back around to create uh, sort of a parallel route that could go across Orchard Trails Drive and ultimately connect the uh, Washburn place uh, to allow to relieve some of that uh, which is a problematic left turn volume out of both of those two locations. Um, this is, now that, that type of project um, is a significant investment, but what we could do is invest in getting the project shovel ready. So do some design work, do some survey, do some design, get it to the point where we're ready to go. So if a funding opportunity does come and given the way state and federal uh, funding looks to be transitioning a bit toward infrastructure investment. There may be some larger grant opportunities that come along that, and with this one, a, a really big, uh, you know, impacts the community. This might be an, a, a good investment to try to um, get this project shovel ready. And I would say we would need about $100,000 to get that to the point where we, beyond just the concept, um, do some actual survey and design to see how it would work, um, understand what right-of-way acquisition costs would be and, and those sorts of things. And it's not just grant opportunities, right? Because if it was more shovel ready, we could also make the argument with Bangor area comprehensive transportation yeah. systems to get put on the plan, right? Which Investing, is how we got a lot of the roundabout paid for and other things, right? Yeah, we were a little bit past, I mean, we, I'm, I'm thinking about bringing this one a little bit beyond where we were when we first got, um, first got the roundabout funded but yeah it, getting that project beyond a great idea and getting it to to, to show that it, it it's feasible here's how it would work and here's how much it would cost takes us to that next step to be able to begin to pursue um dot work plans backs work plans and then of course avail ourselves of grant funds if infrastructure grants come along so um you know, and then I just keep going, but I, you know, I, um, those were the, those would be the, if where I was going to prioritize. And of course I just listed off far more than $250,000, but you know, I guess it kind of illustrates where we're at. Right now. <laughs> but, you know, the other option could be to, to go into the CIP to, to the capital infrastructure plan and choose a project and move it forward to alleviate future investment doesn't solve problems here, but, um, you know, I look at a project like um, that's coming up, like the Colburn Drive project that, um, where there's lighting involved, we could put some of those funds toward uh, starting the, uh, well, actually put $100,000 toward that uh, electrical upgrade. And then um, that takes $100,000 off what you need to do um, in the future. So there's a few different options and ways you could spend that money in the, on the infrastructure side. Um, Great. 
Those are my priorities. So what do we go, what, what, do, what do you need? So us? what I'm looking for, number one, I needed to formally apprise you of the fact that your plan for our bond money is no longer working as planned. And I'm looking for any guidance you want to give as to either how, what proposals you want us to bring back or um, what path forward to decide what to do with that $250,000. And I, I know there are only three of us, three of you here, but um, I just, I'm, I'm not comfortable sitting for too long without at least making you aware that yeah. your plan is not the plan. There are some limitations on timing with this money. So we would want to try to get things at least identified for the next construction season, which means giving staff direction in the near future. Not necessarily tonight, but in the near future. Are there um, significant like potential economic like gain incentive out of having better fiber in some of these locations. Like to me, this is just a giant leap forward that we're getting what Otelco is doing. Um, so that's awesome. But like, particularly when you think about Godfrey Drive or something like that, is there, like, do we feel like, or even on Stillwater Ave, there's that huge parcel. Like, do we feel like there's a big in, in economic incentive for us to lay this out in those areas? So I think on Godfrey Drive, we have run into a couple different um, economic development possibilities that um, would have been made easier had we owned the, the dark fiber along the along the um, the corridor. Um, there is, I mean, there's there's access now, but it's with a single provider rather than having um, dark fiber. And then when um, Northern Light came in, they ran their own um, dark fiber um, conduit. So, so when I, go ahead, Sophie, sorry. Just gonna say, when I think about, you know, Stillwater is probably like Park Street, another place that we're gonna see um, development, we know we have some development um, planning to come to, to the planning board for approval there. So you might begin to get density that could make a business case there. However, if I was going to make a case to council for investing in fiber, I would talk about the fact that we have um, population out along Forest Avenue and parts of Stillwater that um, you talk about equity issues. That is where our three mobile home parks are. That is where some of our lower valued homes are. I mean, not all of them, but it's a segment of our population that probably doesn't have the means to decide they're all gonna band together and make a business case for a telco to deal with buried lines or that they would pay a premium to get what they need in their neighborhood. So if we're going to talk about equity with fiber, probably some of our more lower income residents are living out in the area that has lower home values, um, just to, to make the, the case there. And um, what we have seen with Spectrum is they absolutely will not invest in infrastructure outside of areas where they know they are going to rapidly make their money back because of the take rate. So that would be my argument for fiber. And um, can I just not to shoot my own argument down, <laughs> But um, there's also, we do know that there is fiber money out there. The issue is, is that we don't know what the rules are going to be around using it. So the real problem is, will we have poor enough service in these areas to qualify for using the, the um, broadband money that might be out there, whether it is state or um, federal? early indications are maybe. I can't, um, 
but um, it's not a guarantee. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I look at it. I, I maybe selfish or simply. Um, I, I'm not excited about using our money to provide fiber that a private corporation is going to make money on. I mean, I understand the equity issue and, and I'm sympathetic to that, but um, I, I just have a hard time with that. And I know that we have significant infrastructure is issues. Um, that's why we originally started talking about this bond. And if we have an opportunity to make a bigger dent in those infrastructure um, issues, I'm, I'm really supportive of that. I, I, I can get much more excited about that than I can about more dark fiber that the company's gonna make money on. Although I really appreciate the work that the Orono um, Old Town well, Group has done to get a telco in here and to negotiate with them and to have them do more than they planned. And if they hadn't done that work, we would have had to give them $250,000, yeah. so. But we would have gotten it back eventually. True, true. And in this way, um, we're not going to get anything back. Yeah. Never. Never. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm torn on. I. I think, for me personally, I'm torn. I. I. I there's a part of me, and and Bell I, first was the, in the Biden administration, there was a thing about providing um, access for people who were in rural areas, and and apparently that's going to happen. So um, we don't know 100% how things are going to happen yet. There are there's funding for um, lower income um, households to get service, but you have to work with an existing provider. So you have to work with what is available to your property. So some of the um, service that people are purchasing with this are is um, satellite. Some might be through the cable company, uh, some might be DSL. So it all depends on what is available at your property uh, in order to get that, that subsidy. Um, there's also funding that um, is meant to bring broadband to rural areas. You have to um, have service that doesn't meet the um, 25 down three up service level at the moment. Um, the cable company can easily meet that, but that's not necessarily um, a, a service that is sufficient for the needs of a household these days. Um, Connect Maine is changing the definition to be 100 by 100 so that um, that will put more of Maine in um, an unserved status, which means that Orono could qualify for more money. Um, and also, it used to be that the entire census block had to be unserved or underserved. And um, it looks like some of the pots of money are saying that if one parcel is not able to get sufficient broadband service, then that entire um, census block becomes available for, you know, to be funded. So we just don't know. We just don't know right now. They're still trying to work out the details. With that, in, oh, with that in mind, I do feel like looking ahead at infrastructure probably does make the most sense. And we'll know more, like we're taking a giant leap forward with what we're getting on broadband and wait and see what else might support it. And I think it's exciting to have money, to have options. So, um, but I probably would lean more towards the infrastructure ones that Rob presented. So yeah, I, I so my other thing was that my mind went to when I, that's why I asked you the question about Bennett, what it, what it, I, I don't want to get into a situation where that rose is so expensive that we don't take care. It's right there. You can, it's an easy fix to kind of keep up with it. So my mind kind of went that way. So I guess then all three of us are probably in the space of. So if we're all in the space of infrastructure, my thought is we're going to have um, 
so, like Hillside may qualify at least part of it for um, some ARPA funds. We're still waiting for the the interim rule to be finalized. The, uh, the drainage issue. The drainage issue. Um, and so what I would suggest is where we've met, it's on the record that we're working on a plan for the $250,000, which is important. Um, and if Rob kind of waits until we get the final rule, which will also give Bell the opportunity to come back and talk at the same, you know, when the rules come down with broadbanks, it's all kind of connected. Mm -hmm. um, we will be able to come back with a solid proposal. Um, yeah, and I think point. there are some other funding opportunities that still need to run their course. Um, the Park Street project that I talked about on, from Boulder Drive, the town line, is a finalist for funding in FY23, four, three, um, for uh, the Bax region mm -hmm. funding. So that would be a 10% match if, if the town oh. can get that, if the road can wait that long. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, Bennett Road also, both Bennett Road and Park Street, if, if uh, unfunded through the Bax region, qualify for uh, municipal partnership initiative grants, which is, 50%. Which is the 50-50 um, project, similar to the one that we used, the same, same grant that we used to help fund Kelly Road. So mm -hmm. this is other things that, so if we could get a 50-50 grant for Park Street, um, you know, or, or, or Bennett Road for that matter, that frees up funds that we could use to address other issues that we talked about too. So um, there's some time that needs to go by before those processes run their course, but um, we can work with that. Okay. Great. I feel like I have direction. Excellent. So, thank you, Rob. So I have, a, thank you, Bell. I have a suggestion for the next, for the, we're coming up on two hours. Yeah. That's a long time. Yes. Yep. So the American Rescue Plan Act, um, the guidance is still interim. What I can tell you is that the town of Orono is going to receive a little over a million dollars. Um, a group of managers is working, uh, county managers and municipal managers are working with um, Maine Municipal Association and the state of Maine um, to look at how we can maximize the um, use of those opera funds. We've participated in a survey that has gone out to municipalities to talk about what are what are kind of the, the low hanging fruit, the things that are of most importance. Um, and that group is gonna convene at the end of the month to um, talk about the survey results and see, you know, Penobscot County is getting $30 million. Um, Orono is getting a million. The issue is that when the federal government decided how to disperse the funds, they dispersed it with the understanding that Maine and New England was like the rest of the country and we're not. We are a weak county government, strong municipal government. So they sent all this money to the county with the idea that the county was providing all of these municipal services that in the state of Maine, municipalities provide. So we're trying to open up lines of communication with the counties and the state. The state's getting all this money, how can we align it? And um, I know that there's a lot of need, but sometimes the answer is to sit back and wait just a little bit to understand the landscape. I don't wanna to spend town money now on something that we can get dollars somewhere else from. And I don't want to spend the grant money for something that I could leverage that dollar and get $10 worth of benefit to or over this region. So that is a very quick and dirty general, okay? <laughs> the next one, I'm gonna invite Mitch back to the next meeting. and. Um, what I can, if you want to come up just for a second, what I can tell you is that um, we had, um, we went out and recruited Dave Milan into be our economic development director six years ago. 
he came into a town that did not have a formal economic development program. And we built something pretty cool with the Office of Community Development. That said, Mitch and I have a six year relationship working together. And so when I promoted him to be the director of community development and our economic development director, um, we sat down and kind of were talking about how can we maximize all of our skill sets and move us forward, building upon all of the incredible work that Dave has done. So one thing I wanted to do with Mitch is open up our economic development efforts a little bit more. Um, so it's going to be a bigger partnership with the town manager's office than it has been in the past. We have also identified our relationship with the University of Maine on the economic development side to um, be a high, high priority. So Mitch has already started um, inroads with the university taking some areas within that relationship that we have not gotten a lot of traction and we're starting to see more. Um, formalizing what has been a very strong informal relationship with um, their research development, economic development arm. So Jake Ward, Renee Kelly and that team. I, um, we are scheduling a meeting now for Mitch and I to go up and meet with the president and some of her key staff around economic development issues between the town and the university. So we're already kind of seeing those dividends coming. The other thing, I think all of Mitch's years in higher education are making it easier for him to navigate the, the system, um, which is quite a system. Um, so I think I'm excited about that. Um, I am also excited because um, we are, the job was huge for, for Dave. And so we are making some clear delineation in economic development. Um, and we're gonna give Mitch some support with Rob St. Louis. We talked about that during the budget process with business development, business liaison individual. And Mitch and I have been meeting and working with Rob and um, Chief Lowe to identify how that um, is gonna work. And we're gonna take the next six to nine months to really evaluate it to see how this might um, kind of evolve. But the idea being that um, Mitch is involved in um, state and regional economic development initiatives, which is really important for us to be at the table for us to be thought of when things come through the door. Um, he is, I don't know if you know this about Mitch, but he has a master's in business administration. He has a background in running business and understands business planning and all those things that we really wanted when we hired Dave Milan that he brought to the table to help businesses that were struggling. We want to use Rob to identify issues in a more proactive way and funnel um, those needs to Mitch to be able to do that piece. We also are really excited to be working on um, uh, the regional challenge grant, which we came and talked to you about many moons ago. Um, but Orono, Bangor, Brewer, Old Town have all been funded by the Bank of Fed Boston Bank, Fed. Boston Fed, um, to look at addressing um, issues, economic issues around equity. Um, yeah, and workforce. Basically, it was a working communities challenge, and we got together to create uh, kind of a applied for a grant. It's the first stage, which you work through and build your team, and then you apply for a second grant, which you kind of implement. Um, and we're in that first stage, uh, and we're lucky enough to have Laura, actually. Uh, Councillor Mitchell works as our facilitator, so she's been helping us as well. So, I was going to mention that for full disclosure. <laughs> <laughs> so our plan long term, this is a very quick and dirty kind of description. Our plan long term is to have Mitch come back to this committee on a more 
regular periodic basis um, to give some um, information. So what's important for the world to know that all had Dave's cell phone is that Mitch too has a cell phone um, and that we're offering all the same services I will have you know, Dave is still volunteering for the department. So if there are things that we haven't run into before, we still have um, some unpaid labor. Um, and that is, I, I think the, the idea was just, I, I think there have been questions about what are we doing with economic development and that tells you the biggest Good. priorities. Um, I would defer a town manager's report um, other than to say we're planning to meet on August 2nd. This is a meeting that's going to focus on our rental and student housing um, ordinances. We've got a few we're going to bring back um, for at least a first initial reaction. Um, these are reworks of existing ordinances. These are not like making a bunch of new regulation. Um, also, at the beginning of that meeting, we will have a special council meeting because we have a marijuana license application for red brick and mortar doing business as Firestorm out at Six Stillwater Avenue. Maybe I read that public hearing announcement, um, which will happen on the second. Um, the ordinance requires that council hold a public hearing and make a decision before they can open. They want to open that last week of August. Mm -hmm. That's what I have. Great. So okay, this is that press release. Is that the, absolutely fine. Hey, Bill, the press release is absolutely fine. Tom likes the words. <laughs> All right, I will send it back to her and say A OK from us, except for changing the spelling of my name. Did she need to put an E in it? No, she used an I instead of a Y. I gotcha. All right. <laughs> hey, Thank you all very much. All right, much. guys. Thanks a lot. Thank Bye, you. Laura.